I was hoping you were home. Okay, Audrey, you really freaked us out in Descendants 3. We know you lost your shot at the crown, not to mention your boyfriend, but don't worry. You don't have to be the queen of mean to get what you want. We think we speak for everyone when we say we're glad you put down that scepter. But we have to be honest, your evil look was wicked cool. Before you judge Audrey, there are some things you need to know about her. She's not your typical villain kid. She's a good princess gone bad, gone good again. But here's what nobody realizes about Audrey in Descendants 3. Keep watching to find out who she's teaming up with after D3. Audrey didn't start out as evil. Sure, she was a little full of herself, and yes, she thought Ben was her property. We're not even sure she loved Ben or if she was dating him so she could just rule Oridon. I was Prince Ben's girlfriend on the fast track to becoming his wife and the queen. Audrey was clearly bitter about Mal stealing everything she ever wanted, but she shocked everyone when she stole Maleficent's scepter and turned into the Queen of Mean. How did this happen? Let's start at the beginning and piece this thing together. At the beginning of the movie, Audrey wasn't planning on creating a sleep spell that knocked out all of Oridon. She had just returned from the salon, rested and fresh with a fabulous new makeover. You could see the look of complete and total shock on her face when Ben proposed to Mal. We watched Audrey's dream of being the Queen of Oridon shatter like a glass slipper. When Audrey broke into the museum, she didn't intend to go full evil. She just wanted to steal the crown. Did you notice that she didn't even put the crown on her head until after she transformed into evil Audrey? She was about to throw it away, but then the scepter hypnotized her the same way Maleficent hypnotized Sleeping Beauty. Some people thought that Audrey caused the guard at the front of the museum to fall asleep. But what if it was the scepter? Maleficent's scepter beckoned Audrey into the museum and lured her into going full villain. The scepter wanted her to take control of it. The magic in that staff was too much for Audrey to resist. She was under an evil spell which caused her to cast many additional evil curses. So was it all Audrey's fault? Keep watching to find out. When Ben and Mal got engaged, Audrey didn't only lose out on the crown. She also lost her first love. Ben was the only boy she's ever had eyes for. She had her future with him all planned out. We know that Mal didn't mean to do it, but she took it all away from Audrey. It seemed that Audrey had everything a princess could want, but did she truly love Ben? Audrey was betrothed to Ben since she was just a little girl. Perhaps her grandmother convinced her to love Ben despite what she really wanted. In Audrey's room, there are pictures of her and Ben going all the way back to preschool. Audrey was too young to be able to choose a partner for herself back then. Those photos were staged by Audrey's grandmother. Mother. Who knows if Audrey would have chosen Ben to be her boyfriend if she had a choice from the beginning. So who would she choose if it were up to her? We'll get into that a little bit later. It's obvious that Audrey only wants to make her grandmother proud. In fact, every action Audrey takes in the Descendants movies is tied to her need to please her Grammy. So when Audrey hears her grandmother's biting words of disapproval after Mal and Ben's engagement, it cuts her to her core. All she ever wanted was to make her Grammy proud. Our family status gone. Queen Leah's expectations of Audrey were impossible to achieve. Audrey reached her breaking point when she learned she would never be the Queen of Oridon. That's when she crowned herself the Queen of Mean. Underneath all of that pink hair and distressed leather was just a little girl who needed the unconditional love and approval of her grandmother. Instead, her grandmother slapped her with that cruel comment that Audrey's mother could hold onto a prince in her sleep. Now we see where Audrey learned to be so mean. Now here's the really mind-blowing thing that nobody gets about Audrey. If it wasn't for her, the barrier would have never been opened. Audrey's evil deeds became the catalyst for change in Oridon. Allow us to explain. Before Audrey stole the crown and the scepter, another villain was stirring up trouble. That's right, we're talking about Hades. After he pushed his way through the barrier and almost stole all of Mal's powers, everyone in Oridon was terrified. They wanted to close the barrier for good, and it was all Mal's idea, which was a total woe moment for fans. I think that we have to close the barrier forever. If Audrey hadn't stolen the crown and scepter, put a sleep and stone spell on everyone, and turned Ben into a beast, Mal would have learned nothing. Instead, Mal came to realize that there is both good and evil in everyone. That realization is what made Mal decide to take down the barrier for good. So, thanks, Audrey. 
Thankfully, when Audrey woke from her deep sleep, she was back to her old self again. Alas, she was still without a prince on her arm, but don't feel bad for her. From the sparks flying between Audrey and Harry, we think the pirate's life might be right for Audrey. So what's your verdict? Is Audrey mean or misunderstood? Sound off in the comments. Ah, just a witch here and there. Mostly it's a lot of scrubbing and scouring and sweeping. We were so excited when you got a chance to go to Oridon, Dizzy. We just knew that Evie had to pick you. After all, you are practically her little sister. I can't believe I get to live with you in your very own castle! You might have spent most of Descendants 3 under a sleeping spell, but there is a lot more to you than meets the eye. And we are here to clear up all the reasons you're such an awesome character. Dizzy Tremaine is one of the newest VKs in Oridon. Check out these theories and connections that no one realized about Dizzy. Family Business When we first meet Dizzy in Descendants 2, she works in her grandmother's salon. We don't meet Lady Tremaine until the third movie, but she seems to treat Dizzy a lot like she treated Cinderella. Dizzy is responsible for doing all the cleaning, and she gets yelled at too. But her relationship with her grandmother is way more complicated than that. We don't get to see a lot of interaction between them, but here's what we know from Descendants 3. It seems like Lady Tremaine is the main parental figure to Dizzy. Dizzy's mom is Drizella, and her aunt is Anastasia. But we never see Cinderella's two wicked stepsisters. When Dizzy is ready to leave the aisle, her mom and aunt are nowhere to be seen. But her grandmother is there to say goodbye to her. Lady Tremaine is super strict, but Dizzy loves her. She gives her a big hug. This family obviously doesn't like to show affection. Lady Tremaine is totally taken aback by the gesture. Their relationship may not be perfect, but there is definitely love there. But why don't we see Drizella? Well, let's be honest, Drizella is not cut out to raise a kid. Don't you remember how childish and awful she was in Cinderella? Lady Tremaine has raised two daughters, so she's the obvious choice when it comes to raising Dizzy. Dizzy is also related to someone from Oridon. They don't mention this in the movie, so you might not have noticed. But Dizzy is related to Chad Charming. Dizzy's mom, Drizella, was the stepsister of Cinderella. Chad is the son of Prince Charming and Cinderella. That means that Chad and Dizzy are cousins. Well, technically, they're step cousins, but there are lots of blended families that don't make that distinction. Dizzy acts more like the sweet Cinderella we know and love. And Chad is so spoiled, he acts more like Drizella did. These two should have switched parents. We bet that Dizzy and Chad will connect, and Cinderella will be the awesome aunt that Dizzy deserves. The next Evie. I would like to begin with the granddaughter of Lady Tremaine. Each of the core four got to pick the next generation of VKs to come to Oridon. Our original villain kids are just about done with school. They picked kids that really resonated with them. Jay and Carlos picked Squeaky and Squirmy because no one expected much from those boys. No one ever expected much from Carlos and Jay either, but they believe in the Smee twins. Mal picked Celia because she's the baddest kid on the aisle, and Evie picked Dizzy because they're so similar. They're definitely the sweetest of the villain kids. They see the good in people and being mean just doesn't come naturally to them. Dizzy is also a fashionista just like Evie. Evie brought her fashion design skills to Oridon Prep. Dizzy will bring her awesome salon skills. We expect to see some awesome hairstyles at the school now. No magic needed. She's also talented at making accessories like Evie's tiara from Descendants 2. Evie respects Dizzy's talents. We think these two will end up in business together after Dizzy graduates. Evie loves Dizzy, they're just like sisters. Dizzy's mom got to grow up with a sister, but Dizzy is an only child, and she didn't get a lot of affection at home. But she did from Evie. Evie was the person who believed in Dizzy. She was always quick to hug her and encourage her. Evie wanted Dizzy in Oridon because she knows she belongs there. She's smart and kind and talented, and now Dizzy can be the cool, loving older sister to the Smee twins and other VKs. Why Dizzy Didn't Fight after meeting Dizzy in the second movie, we expected her to have a much bigger role in Descendants 3, but we really didn't get to see too much of her. Mal tells her to stay with the twins. Dizzy, Squeaky, and Squirmy all fall under Audrey's sleeping spell, so why didn't Dizzy fight? She might be like Evie in a lot of ways, but there is one important difference. Dizzy doesn't know how to fight. Most of the villain kids learned how to fight from their parents, but Dizzy's family wasn't particularly skilled in combat or savvy in magic. Dizzy didn't have anyone tough to show her the ropes. If Dizzy had gone to the aisle with Mal, Celia, and the rest, she wouldn't have fallen under the sleeping spell, but she would have been in way more danger. 
Dizzy, stay here to take care of the twins. We'll be right back and everything will be just fine. Go inside. Mal and Evie wanted to protect her, and Dizzy wasn't even upset about it. You don't have to be tough to be a VK. Dizzy just knows that she has her strengths. She's responsible and caring. Still, part of us wishes that Dizzy had been a more prominent figure in Descendants 3. Do you think Dizzy made the right choice by staying in Oridon? Or could she have helped the VKs throughout their quest? Tell us in the comments, and be sure to tell us what you love about Dizzy while you're at it. Oh, Jafar, you did an amazing job at raising Jay. Sure, you turned him into a master thief, but unlike the rest of the VKs, you and Jay had a pretty strong relationship. He stole things to help you run your shop, and he rubbed every lamp he came across. <gasps> Just in case it was the one you were searching for. Jay is always there for his friends, and he's got family values in the bag. So we guess what we're trying to say is, thank you for giving us Jay. Jay has changed a lot throughout the Descendants franchise, but we didn't realize just how much he had evolved until we watched Descendants 3. Here are 10 things nobody realizes about Jay. When we first meet Jay, it didn't take us long to find out that he had sticky fingers. Jay could shake your hand and swipe your wallet and you'd be none the wiser. Jay continued to steal stuff when he first came over to Aradon, but it didn't take long for his fingers to lose their grip. We couldn't believe our eyes when Jay stopped Harry from stealing an AK's wallet in Descendants 3. Wow, he sure has come a long way. Jay loves his freedom and everything that comes with it. He plans to travel and embark on more adventures than he can count. Although it's hard to believe, Jay is the only single VK out of the original core four. Evie has Doug, Mal has Ben, and Carlos has Jane. And when it comes to Jay, he's got adventure on the brain. Jay doesn't seem to mind the single life. He looks happy to be on his own in Descendants 3. But Jay is never alone because his fellow VKs have quickly become his family, and Jay values family above all else. When the VKs were given the task of choosing a recruit, Jay chose to pair up with Carlos and pick the Smee twins. Jay wanted to keep the twins together no matter what. He knows how how important it is to be surrounded by family, which is why he would never separate Squeaky and Squirmy. And no way we're splitting up the twins, so get over here, Squirmy, come on! <laughs> But while Jay may be content with hanging out with the fam, there is one person he didn't bother mentioning throughout the film, and that's Lonnie. Most of us thought that Jay and Lonnie would be an item by Descendants 3, because, well, they totally hit it off in D2. But for some strange reason, Jay remained single throughout the threequel and never once mentioned his could-have-been girlfriend. We wonder what happened between these two. Although we don't get the full story, we do know that Lonnie is spending most of her time with her Swords and Shields team. And since Jay loves sports, he would never stop her from following her passions. Jay's real passion, on the other hand, is playing Tourney. He's the Tourney team's star player, and he proudly wears number 8 on his back. Did you guys notice how Jay usually sports an embroidered cobra on his back? He loves to represent Jafar, and he does this on the Tourney field too. His number 8 is easily switched out for a cobra, mimicking the infinity sign. Whereas Carlos wants to become a veterinarian, Jay wants to become a professional Tourney player. Jay's dream is to go pro and become a Tourney coach once he's done playing the field. So while Mal and Ben will be busy ruling over Aradon and the Isle, Jay will be touring the world and playing his favorite sport. It takes a lot of guts to go after our dreams, but Jay knows what he wants and he's not afraid to go after it. And luckily for Aradon, Jay's one of the bravest VKs of all time. This was proven in D3 when Hades managed to sneak his head and arm out of the barrier. Jay was the first one to charge Hades. His bravery is undeniable, but unfortunately, it resulted in him being the first one to get blasted by Hades. Luckily, Mao's dad didn't actually hurt anyone. <gasps> Jay has always been brave, which makes us wonder if this is something his father taught him. You might have noticed how Jay is the only VK out of the core four to have a single father instead of a single mother, but the scale tipped in Descendants 3 when Hades was revealed as Mal's dad. Now both Mal and Jay have father figures in their lives, but who could Jay's mother be? If you have any theories, comment them down below. Some people believe that Jay's mom was a pirate, and the reason behind this assumption makes sense. In Return to the Isle of the Lost, Jay gets approached to join Captain Hook's pirate crew. However, Jay refuses and continues to help his father run his shop. It would make sense for Jay's mom to be a pirate since he was approached by Captain Hook, but in the end, Jay ended up being close friends with Uma, Harry, and Gil, so he might very well have the sea coursing through his veins. I like how you get a kick out of a berry bush. 
We were happy to see Jay hit it off with Gil because, well, Jay seemed to be a little lonely in Descendants 3. While Jay had plenty of friends, they were all in relationships and making future plans without him. So finding a friend like Gil was super important. Jay looked so excited when he started bonding with Gil. And now the boys have plans to travel the world for the entire year. You know what would be fun? To go rafting in a jungle river. Find a lost civilization. Oh, or maybe a penguin. We wish we could watch their adventures on the small screen. What do you say you and me go exploring? I'll do a gap year. Jungles or icebergs? Both. Oh. <laughs> yeah. So did you guys notice anything else about Jay and Descendants 3? Sound off in the comment section. On the plus side, it's been the longest birthday I've ever had. On the minus side, everybody's under an evil spell. Real talk, Jane. Do you have any idea how awesome you are? Many fans see you as the unsung hero of Descendants 3. Carlos was lucky to be with a smart go-getter like you. If only you could see what the rest of the world sees. You are obsessed with magic, but the truth is, you are magic. And we love to watch you shine, so own it, girl. There is one descendant who is more than she appears to be, and one villain kid saw that before everyone else. That's why he fell hopelessly in love with her. There are so many things about Jane that nobody realizes. Watch until the end to find out what secret magical powers Jane possesses. You need another blast. I th uh, please. Please stop. Huh. Do you guys remember when Jane stepped into her power in Descendants 2? She was a boss in charge of the entire cotillion, and it was epic. She definitely came a long way since her days of following Audrey around in the first Descendants movie. But Jane's journey reveals something you may have missed about the fairy godmother's daughter. Let's start at the beginning. Jane started out as a shy, sweet little Oridon gal who was afraid of the villain kids from the Isle. That's okay. Don't mind me. As you were. Jane was fascinated with magic, even though her mother wouldn't let her anywhere near it. Jane had trouble figuring out who she truly was in the first movie. That's why she helped Audrey bully Mal. She had no self-confidence. This lack of self-esteem caused her to only see her value in her appearance, but we all know now that there is so much more to her than that. Once Jane slowly started to accept the VK, she started to accept herself as well. Becoming friends with Mal and her crew helped Jane to see that it's not just about your outside appearance, it's what's inside your heart that counts. That's when she really takes the lead in Descendants 2. Jane steps into the leadership role in D2 with the planning of the cotillion. She is much more outgoing and happy. This makes her irresistible to Carlos. But along with the newfound confidence comes a bit of cluelessness. She gets frazzled easily during the planning of the big celebration, and she's totally oblivious to Carlos having a crush on her. When he tries to ask her out, he has to explain over and over again what he means. It's gonna be tricky. Jane? Would you be my date for Cotillion? Carlos is so happy when she finally says yes. And let's not forget Jane is the one who tried to stop Ben and Uma from getting together by unveiling Ben's gift for Mal at the cotillion. By accepting the villain kid, she started accepting herself as well. But Jane's transformation in D3 was the most surprising one of all. Keep watching to find out more about her secret powers. In D3, Jane doesn't know why Carlos misses her birthday celebration, but even then, she still believes in Carlos, and sure, Jane can be a bit naive sometimes, but she still outsmarts Audrey. She jumps into the enchanted lake to avoid succumbing to Audrey's sleep spell. Jane calls to warn Ben and also tries to call her mom so she could get her wand and put a stop to the madness. She takes action rather than staying on the sidelines, and she saves the day again when she sprays Ben with water from the enchanted lake to turn him back from the beast to man. Where did this Jane come from? She just did what needed to be done. She didn't ask for permission from anyone. Jane has come a long way since the first Descendants movie. And can we talk about what a cute couple Jane and Carlos are? Even when she thought Carlos forgot her birthday, all she cared about was if he was alright, and he was so happy to see her. Her. That birthday gift Carlos got for Jane was perfect. Jarlos forever. It broke our hearts when Jane saw that her mom was turned to stone, but this is the biggest moment when we see Jane's true self shine. We're going to figure out how to undo this. We'll find a way to make this right, Mom.
She is now the one reassuring and rescuing her mother. She has to rely on the very magic that her mother forbade her to use not that long ago. Jane represents the heart of the movie. She is kind, brave, and in charge. The old Jane would have crumbled under this kind of pressure, but this new and improved Jane finally understands the impact she can have on Oridon. Here's the truth about Jane that nobody realizes. Jane knows just how strong and mighty the power of love can be. She knows that you can change an entire kingdom by connecting with the person right in front of you. Jane took the time and effort to encourage every person she met, and when her mom was turned back into her human self, Jane was there to comfort her. She told her mom that it's okay. This heart-to-heart -heart connection that Jane fosters between herself and others makes her the unsung hero of the Descendants movies. Mal and Audrey went through some major transformations throughout the Descendants movies, but Jane also grew and changed significantly. She didn't understand that she had power without magic all along, but by the end of D3, she knows that her magical powers are leadership and compassion. In the future, we can see her becoming a great ambassador for Oridon, sitting right next to Mal and Ben on the throne. All leaders must have courage and compassion, and that is why Jane is the queen of compassion. Do you think Jane is the unsung hero of Descendants 3? If so, leave a star emoji down below. If you disagree, tell us who you think the real hero of Descendants 3 is in the comments. Thank you for watching! Hit that subscribe button and notification bell to be the first to know when we post a new video. And don't forget to give us a big thumbs up! We'll see you later!